Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here as usual with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. We have a great guest for you this week, Beth Revis. I'll go ahead and read your bio, Beth, before uh, letting you uh, talk about yourself. <laughs> but um, uh, according to Amazon, she is a native of North Carolina, a New York, New York Times best-selling author with books available in more than 20 languages. Her latest title, A World Without You, is a semi-autobiographical story blending the supernatural with mental illness and comes out on uh, July 19th of this year. That's my birthday, so obviously it's going to be a good book. <laughs> uh, Beth, Beth is also the author of the Across the Universe series, The Body Electric, numerous short stories, and the nonfiction Paper Heart series, uh, which we'll be asking her about later since there's a lot of advice in there for writers. Um, hi, Beth. I guess I should let you talk. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, an honor. <laughs> Who told you it was going to be an honor? <laughs> no, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, why don't you tell us how you got started with writing and uh, kind of how you, maybe how that first deal went with, uh, for those who don't, we get a mix of self-published and traditional authors. So uh, Beth is mostly traditional published, although it looks like you have one novel that you did yourself. So I, I'm 50-50 now because the paper hearts are all self. So exactly 50-50. I've got eight books out, four self and four traditional. Um, so I got started writing uh, when I was a sophomore in college. I was trying to write a short story, and I just kept writing, and it turned into a novel. And I was a complete newbie. I had no idea what I was doing at all. I submitted it to agents, and they all soundly rejected me because that book really, really sucked. Um, but I didn't let that stop me. I kept writing, and I wrote the next one. That was a sequel to it because that was a really smart idea to write a sequel to a book that had gotten rejected. Um, that was also rejected, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, and then I wrote another and another and another and another and another. And I wrote 10 books over 10 years. And none of them were accepted for publication. Um, Across the Universe was the 11th book, and I really was about to completely give up at that point in time. But I had the idea. I thought, I will give it one last shot. And I wrote Across the Universe, and that changed everything. That's definitely some dedication there to keep going <laughs> in the face of all that rejection. Yeah, it was about more than 1,000 rejections. Wow. Were you in a writer's yeah. group or doing classes or anything during that time? The first half, when I was still in college, not really. I um, I took some creative writing classes in college, and they were all completely horrible. Um, the teachers would say, whatever you do, you cannot write science fiction or fantasy, because then all your problems are just solved with a magic wand or a ray gun, which obviously is not how science fiction or fantasy works. Um, so I didn't really get that much feedback and critique experience when I was in college, because I was surrounded by literary snobs. But once I was out of college and was able to make some more connections on my own and find um, my people, it worked out a lot better. Awesome. And did you get an agent, or were you just kind of submitting to the publishing houses? And oh, I well, I knew that for my debut, I really wanted to have a New York traditional larger house deal. Like that—that that was my goal. And I think as as long as you have a goal, whatever your goal may be, that's that's fine. But that was my goal. So I knew I needed an agent, and I, I I went the query route and the agent route, and I was a complete slush pile baby. I had no connections. I had no publishing credentials. I never got a short story published before I had my book deal. So I, I was the complete, utter slush pile baby, and it worked out. So, I mean, it took a decade, but it still worked out. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to be said for persistence, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully they weren't going like, oh gosh, her again? No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fortunately, by the time I was on my fourth or fifth novel, I was of drinking age, so that really helped. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so that's a trilogy, right? The Across the yes. Universe series? Yeah. And it looks like your fourth book you decided to self-publish. What made you decide to switch over to the other side? Well, the Across the Universe trilogy is a, basically a murder mystery in space where the characters are on a, a generation spaceship and they're heading to a planet solving mysteries and that sort of thing. Um, there's lots of blood and kissing and all the good stuff. Uh, the Body Electric is what happens on Earth while Amy and Elder, the characters in Across the Universe, are in space. And so it's loosely connected to the original trilogy, but it's still very much a sci-fi. It's a futuristic world. It's sort of a Blade Runner meets uh, Total Recall type story. I, I really love Philip K. Dick, um, but I'm never allowed to tell people that my books are Dick-inspired because it doesn't go over very well. 
Um, but, but anyway, so I had this new science fiction idea in this book, and it didn't really fit with my publisher's catalog. They did not want more science fiction. They were moving more into a contemporary and um, some epic fantasy, but that imprint was moving a little bit away from science fiction. So I had this property, and it fit well. The time was right, and it made perfect sense to self-publish it. All right, now I'm excited to read your books because there's blood and kissing and they're dick inspired. So <laughs> it sounds like a winning combination to me. It's all the things I love. <laughs> did you have any trouble? Did they give you a hard time, like wanting to publish in the same universe, or were you, were they okay with you going off to self-publish? They were fine with it. We presented it to my publisher first, and when they didn't want it, then it was it was very accepted and like, okay, obviously, if we don't want it, you can self-publish it. Okay. Now that you've kind of seen both sides, what are your thoughts on one or the other? Do you think uh, you'd kind of try to traditionally publish first, or do you think you'd stick, try more self-publishing with your next series? Or Well, I guess your next book will be traditionally published. Yeah, the, yeah, the next one is going to be traditionally published, and I, I like both for different reasons. Um, I did not think I would be the kind of person who actually cared about the freedom that self-publishing gives you, but when I did it for the first time, it, it really was a unique experience to be able to have complete say-so in the design of the book from the, the cover to the typography, all of it. That was a really important thing to me that I didn't think would be important to me. Um, so that, I really enjoyed that. Um, but I, I also really enjoy the backing of a publisher. I enjoy the paycheck of a publisher. I enjoy the marketing that they can do and the weight that they have in the distribution of bookstores. So for me, it's not so much of I want to be one or the other for sure, it'll depend on the project. If I have a project that I need to be a very personal project or one that's very niche, I have absolute confidence in myself to self-publish it. If it's something that I want to reach a wider audience, then it will go towards traditional publishing. All right, sounds good. And uh, I definitely think the people who have the opportunity to do the hybrid thing, it seems like you're getting the best of both worlds that way. Because uh, you know, there are still people who will only read the traditionally published stuff, and they do have the reach to get you into bookstores and such. So. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead. We kind of want to ask you some questions about the marketing later and about your writing books too, but I'm going to let the guys ask a few more questions about uh, your writing and what you're working on. Yeah, uh, I'm going to start things off then with, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, you've got a book coming out in July called A World Without You. I looked at mm -hmm. the prequel order page, and it's pretty compelling. Uh, want to tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I pitched A World Without You as uh, an X-Men Academy story where instead of being an X-Men, they're actually mental patients. And this is... I, I said before I was Dick Inspired, I also really like Christopher Nolan and Memento and that sort of twist of what's real and what's not. So A World Without You on the surface is a story about a boy who thinks he has the power to control time, but in reality he is in an emotionally, uh, a school for emotionally disturbed students. And he has to discover the truth at the same time that the reader is discovering the truth. So th that's the, the outward premise of it. It's also a very emotional book for me because it's loosely based on my brother's experiences. And so there's a character in there who sees from the outside and it's the sister of the character and that very much became a personal story for me in ways that I would not have gotten there without my editor. So, so it's, a, it's a little bit of fun, excitement, blow things up, travel through time, and then also emotions. See, so that's a potent mix right there. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, like, so I, I'm intrigued, particularly because something I've n I've not done yet, and I sort of want to. Is it seems like there's a, there's at least an element of sort of unreliable narrator in there. Yeah. And it's it's that's a that's a I want to say a uh, I'm a technique that's that's very interesting to me. And and it, you you mentioned Christopher Nolan, and it, funny enough, I'm going to mention Philip K. Dick in a moment. But uh, both of them are very good at uh, blurring the lines of fantasy and reality in in their works. So. Uh, if, if those people have inspired you and you've produced this, I think it's going to—it's got a pretty good pedigree already. Ah, thanks. That, that's exactly what I was trying to do with these books, and also with Across the Universe, because there's an unreliable narrator in there. I, I love that trope as well. I, some people have told me, like, oh, this new book is a contemporary. and it, I mean, it is in as much as it takes place in the real world, but it's still really twisted and weird. That's excellent stuff. <laughs> and yeah, so... Uh, 
it's this you know we write our questions beforehand just to give you a little peek behind the curtain so it's kind of funny that you had mentioned that you sort of can't bring up that it's Philip K Dick inspired here's what I wrote you mentioned the story is semi autobiographical there are themes of mental illness uh, Philip K Dick did something similar late in his career was there any insp inspiration or influence there so <laughs> yeah. answer that question yes. uh, so I guess I'll just move on to the next one uh, all right your covers and bio proudly proclaim you to be a New York Times bestseller. How did you earn that distinction and do you think it helped your career at all? Oh, it absolutely helped my career. Like that that was a game changer. And it was a game changer before I even started. I was lucky enough to debut on the bestseller list. Oh, and that is yeah. And that's that I mean that a lot of that came from my publisher and that's one reason why I absolutely can never discredit the power of the publisher because my publisher really pushed for the book. They gave, they sent me on um, pre-publication tours to bookstores, to library conferences, things like that, and really got the word out. But it has absolutely made a difference. There's a like a I don't I don't want to say like a badge of honor, but there's sort of a an acceptance that I'm not some sort of hack, especially when I did the self-published book. Like people saw that title and they're like, oh, this is somebody who takes her career seriously, and she didn't just throw it up there. So it, it definitely helped. And there, obviously thousands of great writers who don't have the title, but I'm very, very, very grateful to have it. Yes, it's still, I mean, like, there are a lot, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people who have said of, like, the New York Times bestseller list that uh, once you have earned that distinction, it can't help you anymore because you've already gotten as far as it might have been able to, to bring you. So it's good to, particularly at the very beginning of your career, it's, that's just, it's got to be a remarkable leg up, so congratulations on that. It was also really comforting because the exact same week that I found out that I was a New York Times bestseller, I got a rejection from an agent from a query I'd sent a year ago. <laughs> so it humbled me, but also made me kind of go, ha ha. That's that's fantastic. I have I have uh, I've had daydreams in the past about I. First off, congratulations on enduring. You went into the quadruple digits on, on rejections. I gave yes. up after like fifty. Oh, I, yeah. I had that with my first one. <laughs> well, I only, yeah, I gave up after the first one. I just went self pub after that. And I have had like daydreams about about situations where where people have rejected me. Like I recently, uh, one of my one of my books was picked up by a uh, a German publisher and ended up sticking on the fairly high. It's, it stuck fairly high on the Amazon ratings in uh, in Germany once it was released. And I have been previously like sort of. Uh, uh, queried by a German publisher before that, and then they turned me down. So I kind of want to like write a letter to them and be like, "Hey, listen, it turns out it, it would have been a pretty good thing to do." Been awesome. <laughs> so yeah, it definitely, definitely getting a rejection on the same day. Like, it's, I, I would have like replied to him like, "Do you read the newspaper?" <laughs> yeah, the best part was in the rejection. They said something like, "Space sci-fi doesn't sell for teens." <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, well, actually. <laughs> good stuff. Uh, yeah, well, well, thanks to to uh, uh, I guess foresight on my part, that all of my questions have now been answered. So I'm just going to hand you off to Jeff for the next set. Awesome. <laughs> well, first and foremost, congrats on being the New York Times bestseller. That is absolutely awesome. Thank you. Many of us strive for for doing things like that. So I have a question for you. Now that you've been able to see what life is like as both a traditionally published author and as an, as an indie, what would you say would be the most difficult challenges facing someone looking to publish? their first novel this year? Oh, well, um, it depends. Obviously, it would depend on your route and, and which path you want to take. If your first novel is going to be self-published, the biggest um, hurdle that you're going to have to cross is exposure and getting people to even notice that you exist because there are millions of books on Amazon and standing out from the crowd and just having people actually even find you, much less think that you're good, just know that you exist is your biggest jump. Um, for traditional publishing, it, especially in YA, and, and this is all of this is tempered with YA because that's what I exclusively write and really almost exclusively read, it's, we were in a market boom in YA. We had Harry Potter and Twilight and Hunger Games and Divergent. We're starting to hit a marketing slump. So now your biggest issue is to find a way to break out in a market that's very, very scared because we've had so many books that we expected to be huge weren't huge and there's not been a money maker like Hunger Games and Twilight and Harry Potter in quite some time. So now for traditional publishing is proving that you can be a blockbuster hit 
with something new and possibly even breaking genre boundaries. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, I'm starting to rattle. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I would think that actually might actually be something good if you can find some way to stand out from the rest of the group. And it yeah. sounds like the market is like hungry for something new. So you know, like, obviously, you know, Hunger Games, you know, the Divergent series and all that jazz, everyone's like, okay, this is great. Man, I would love, love to see something new here. And if you can somehow mm -hmm. hit it, you know, that sounds like whether you're indie or traditional, that would be really good for you. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's just it's so hard because if we knew how to do it, we all would be doing it. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, isn't that the right red stuff? Okay, and also I was ask you too is, uh, it, what what would? I mean, let me just read the question the way I wrote it. When a brand new author is facing the choice whether to pursue traditional publishing, or you know just do it release it as an indie, what would you what would you personally recommend now that you've experienced it both ways? I mean, obviously it'd be easier to release it as an indie, but is there anything out there that would you know actually would you give you the advice like, no, you really ought to take this traditional and not do the indie. I don't really know if it would be easier to start off as indie because, like I said, you do have the uphill battle of getting exposure and, and finding it. My self-publication journey was incredibly easy compared to a lot of other people who debut with self-pub because I had the backing of a traditional publisher. I already had the audience established. I already had the social media and the newsletter connections. All of that was already established, which made the glide into self-publishing so much easier. But ultimately, I think it just depends on your goals and what you really want. Some people, what they want more than anything is to just walk into a random bookstore and see their book on a shelf. And if that's what you want, then you need to have a traditionally published book because otherwise, a self-published book is almost always only going to be in a bookstore based on consignment. If what you want is to just get the book out there and hit a trend and see how it can go, then indie publishing may be for you. But you really need to analyze what you want out of your career and out of your book before you make that decision on the path. Okay, that makes sense. And if you learn, okay, if you learn a friend of yours has written a book and is set on contacting a traditional publisher, what words of advice slash encouragement slash you know, concern would you would you give them? Hmm. Um, I would definitely say, like, okay, so a practical advice would be to query in stages. Um, QueryTracker.net is a fantastic resource to go to to look for queries and who to, a who to um, query as an agent. Um, they have a list of who represents who and all sorts of things like that. So I would say go to QueryTracker.net, compile a list of, say, 50 agents, and that's not a very unreasonable list. I, I know a lot of people will go even to 100, but say get a list of 50 agents who represent your work and who you want to work with, and then query in batches. Query 10. Pick out five that are fairly new and five that are like the dream agents that you would hate yourself if you missed an opportunity with. Send your query out to those 10 and see what the response is. If you get complete blanket rejections based on the query alone, that means your query letter is not well written and you need to go back and revise that query letter. So if you've got blank rejections in the first 10, revise your query letter, send it out to the next 10 on the list. If they're requesting pages but rejecting you after the sample, then that means your first three chapters, first 50 pages aren't good enough. You need to, re you need to, to fix that and clean it up and make them back perfect. So revise again and then send out the next to the next batch. So I would say research your agents and then query in a specific strategic way that will maximize your chances of finding somebody who'll fit your work. All right, and now obviously, obviously, it takes time. I mean, like for instance, when you're talking okay. about your batches, you'll send out ten, and I'll see what you get there. Then, you'll, based on their those responses, send out another ten. Yeah. If memory serves, you know, obviously, when I went out and tried it, it was we're talking not like talking days or weeks. We're talking months. You know, before mm -hmm. you actually can hear back from some of these people, because obviously, you know, if they publish their information online, other people like us are going to find it. They're like, oh, you've got to see this. So they're just getting blasted with all these emails. So for like for you, yeah. your, your recommendation, how long would you give it? Well, what I what I did when I did it was uh, I would pick out like of the five agents who I would query first. I kind of looked for the reputations of the ones who responded best. And I, I no longer know who those are because I've been out of the querying game for a while. But they're, they're, they're usually the new agents who are very young and they're, they're looking for fresh blood and they're pretty tech savvy and do it on email. I would send to those first and typically those would respond within two or three weeks at most. And that's where I would start start measuring that out and start start guiding it. I, I found through experience that the better the work I, I had, the faster it was responded to. 
So if you're waiting months and months and months and not hearing anything, then chances are your query didn't do well, and you need to go back to the drawing board. All right. Yeah, it's, most of them, when, when you actually, like, if you look up actual publishers, the URLs, you're looking at their websites where they say, if you haven't heard back from us in X amount of days, then yeah. you know, wait, like, say, three, four months and feel free to try again. Otherwise, you know, if we see the same name keep showing up over and over and over, we're just going to delete you right off the bat. So yeah, it, it makes sense. Makes sense. All right, let me pass you over to Lindsay. She's got some uh, marketing questions for you. Okay. All right, as Jeff reveals that he's been blackballed from like 150 <laughs> agents out there. No, I didn't have the patience for any of that. So I was so excited when uh, the Kindle became a thing and I could just jump into self-publishing and not have to wait. I'm not good at patience. All right, but um, Beth, we'd love to hear about the, you've done three books it looks like. Uh, one is on writing, one is on publishing, and one is on marketing. Could you tell us a little about, about that and what kind of advice you've got in them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I Before I was a uh, published writer, I... Well, I was a student for a while, and then I became a teacher, um, and I taught high school English, and I found that I really, really loved that job. And once I became a published writer, I still enjoyed the teaching aspect. So I would have series on my blog about grammar and then about publishing and, and the process of writing and editing and all that stuff. Um, and as I kept doing that, I, I got more and more um, archives built up from that. I, I started moderating a forum on Reddit, the YA Writers Reddit. I started taking questions on Tumblr. I would go to live events. I would teach workshops. And all of this sort of compiled together. And eventually, people started asking me the same questions. And then they would ask for a, a single place that they could go to find the answers. So I started compiling it all in Wattpad. And Wattpad was a great resource for this. And as time went on, it got bigger and bigger. And I realized that I had a whole book here. And people started saying, oh, I liked reading it on Wattpad, but can I get a print version? Can I get it on my Kindle? And things like that. So eventually I started compiling it into an actual book form. And when I got to the end of it, I realized I didn't have one book. I had three books. And so I broke it up based on um, publishing, and, I mean, writing and craft for the first volume, and then publishing, and it goes into both paths of traditional and self-publication, and then marketing for the last one. All right, I'm kind of glad to know that you had it on Wattpad first because I was looking at the publication dates and they're mm. like 350 pages each. I'm like, oh, she's knocking these out in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> they were almost all entirely written before I even started like forming them into books. All right, and you've got, uh, you've got some of your fiction up on Wattpad too. Have you found mm -hmm. that that's useful for the marketing of the nonfiction and or the marketing of the fiction? Yes and no. Um, I, I love Wattpad. I think it's a great community. But Wattpad is primarily, the audience is primarily young teenagers who don't necessarily have the disposable income to then buy a book. And Wattpad has become a very insular community where the people who read on Wattpad, many of those, those audiences only read books on Wattpad and they don't branch out into other books and into other platforms. So if you're only doing Wattpad to make money, it's not necessarily a good thing. If you're doing Wattpad to build a community, to um, gain exposure, to have a landing page where you can send other people beyond just the Wattpad community, I think it can be very helpful and some people have been able to turn it into something much more profitable. Sure, and I've heard of people getting deals too if they do really well on Wattpad. They it looks like if you write that One Direction yeah. fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like if you do really well, that there are people agents that are watching it and seeing which ones get millions of hits and that sort of thing. Yeah, although that's I think that's kind of tapering off because it it's actually extraordinarily easy to get a million hits on Wattpad. Um, every single individual page, as long as somebody clicks on it, it counts as hit. So if I have a story that's broke up into 10 sections and one person reads it, that's actually counted as 10 reads. Whereas if I had just posted it once and one person read it, that's only one read. So there, there are ways to game the system that I think um, is diminishing that enthusiasm. Yeah, I suppose too with, with everything, they if they pick someone up and give them a big deal and then the book doesn't do that well, it's, and which is kind of what I've seen with a couple that I've looked up on there. That, yeah. All right. Well, I'm kind of curious, wondering what kind of marketing your publisher asked you to do, or what and what kind of 
they did for you versus what you've done as a self-publisher? Uh, what are kind of the differences you've had there? My attitude has always been that whatever I make in publishing, 10% of it is going to go back into marketing in some way. So almost everything that my publisher has done, I also sort of emulated as well. My publisher sent me on a national book tour for each one of the three books in the Across the Universe trilogy. I also sent myself on additional tours and organized tours with other authors. And some of them were local, some of them were much larger where I had to take flights and go to different cities. So I, almost everything my publisher has done, I kind of shadowed it and did it again in order to sort of maximize my marketing. Um, but my publisher has been extraordinarily in support of my work. Um, they, they've really been able to do things in ways that I just never had the means to do. So. Cool. It kind of sounds like they thought maybe they had a hit on their hands before the book was even published. If Because it seems like that's kind of rare now to hear them sending authors, a new, especially a new author, out on a yeah. national book tour. I, I definitely got lucky in my timing. I hit just at the time when we were at the height of the market. We're in the slump now, but when Across the Universe came out, it was the height, and I got very lucky in terms of timing. That always, little luck never hurts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did they ask you to do any other, do you, did they ask you to go to conventions and that kind of thing too, or any other kinds of in-person marketing? Yeah, I, I was actually kind of surprised to go to the New York Comic Con. I, it didn't occur to me that books, I mean, aside from comic books, were a big thing at Comic Con, but I've done New York Comic Con twice, and that, that was really amazing. I did not realize the, the publishing presence that was there. Um, I also have done all of the major library markets, especially for a YA doing a school library market conference, such as the ALA Winter Institute or our... our um, NCTE, those sort of conferences have been very, very beneficial. And it especially is helpful with having the publisher support because they have the booths to go to. You can go on your own, but you won't necessarily have a booth. Having the publisher booth and being able to use that as my resource was what made the difference. And did you find it any harder when you were marketing your self-published book to get invited to these places or to, you know, were there fewer doors that were open for you or because you'd already had st successful stuff, did people say, come on in, come sell your book? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, certainly some of some of those opportunities sort of shifted. Um, I've, my publisher has never sent me to BEA because I never had a book that was on schedule for Book Expo America, BEA. But I was invited to go to BEA with my self-publishing book with BookBub. Um, I was able to go because... I was giving birth to a child, but I was invited, so that was nice. Um, so I, there have been different kind of opportunities involved with the self-publishing aspect of it, and it opened some doors that had previously been closed for people who wanted to learn more about the self-publishing and in different conventions and different types of markets in that way. Um, it's been less of the school and market conventions because those they don't stock self-published books in the same way, which it makes sense that it has shifted into which kind of programs I spend more time focused on. When you said stock, I was thinking stock with LK. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They're not stocking you? That's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, have you done much online uh, in addition to all the traveling around the country and being a, a globe trotter there to sell the books. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I am online constantly, probably more than I should be. Um, I do primarily Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr, and I, I pretty much revolve around those, And but they've been immensely helpful. Um, I started building Twitter with the before the first book, really, but I did it for fun, and what I found is that that's the best way to do Twitter or any social media. If you're having fun and you're joining the community, that's all you really need to do, and I continue to do that, and I just really enjoy it, and it shows, and I've kind of built a community of readers. Uh, you mentioned being on Reddit with your uh, mm -hmm. advi advice uh, for writers. Do you do anything to kind of try to sell your books on there, or are you just kind of... A presence helping people out? I, I mostly just hang out and try to help people out and answer questions and post things that I find interesting and that's generally how I approach all social media because I found that the more you just participate and you kind of show that you're human people will be interested in what you do so when I'm on Reddit and somebody says um, how do I 
edit a book, I'll go, well, when I was editing across the universe, I did X, Y, and Z. And that gives exposure for my book, but I'm not selling the book. So if they're interested in me and they care what I have to say, Google, they're on the internet already. They can Google me. They can find me. It's not so much about me making an advertisement. It's about me being a member of a community. All right, sounds good. Last question before I hand you over to the guys again. Have you found that anything in particular works, for, you know, especially for YA science fiction for, for your specific genre? In terms of writing or in terms of marketing? Um, in terms of marketing, but if you want to give writing <laughs> tips too, we're, we're open. <laughs> I'd say, well, in terms of writing, YA science fiction just tends to be much more heavily focused on character as opposed to the, the science aspect of it. So, um, it's more character driven, but in terms of marketing, um, it's, it is about reaching a teen audience, which you don't always do because there's always gatekeepers when it comes to YA, and middle grade more so, but YA also, there's, there are gatekeepers because your audience does not necessarily have a credit card and a Kindle to purchase a book. They sometimes will very often have to go through a parent or a guardian to get the books for them in some way. Um, so it's more about reaching kids in a way that they understand. So, for example, as opposed to doing paid advertisements, I will do a social media campaign encouraging people to make fan art. And that's something interactive that teens can be a part of without having to purchase and they don't, they're not, they're active in it, they're not passive in the promotion of the book. And I think that makes a difference in a way that you won't see in adult literature. All right, and have you actually found from interacting with your readers, do you think that most of them are teenagers? Or I, it seems like so many adults now read YA fiction too that I've yeah. heard it's as high as like 80% of the readers are actually adults. Yeah, oh, there's a huge, huge chunk of my readers that are adult. I would say maybe 50-50. I don't, I don't have the exact statistics on it, but there, there's quite a large group. But the adults that read YA also tend to be adults who are kind of like me and they're kind of like the, the fangirl kind of adults. Like they, they get into the fandom and they become an active part of, of reading. It, most adult readers of YR are not just going to, it's not a beach read, it's not a commute read, it's something that they become involved with as much as you'll see people at comic conventions and things like that. Like this is something that they get, they become a part of the fandom. Yeah, that seems to be really true with science fiction and fantasy fans in general. Uh, we're a special group, <laughs> so but that's <laughs> cool. People. You do, yeah, yeah, you do get things like fan art and stuff like that that I don't think necessarily you get when you're a mystery writer. And I don't know if that's true or not. Jeff's gonna publish a mystery, <laughs> so he'll let us know. I'm uh, kind of worried about some of that fan art. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I've had some nude fan art <laughs> of my characters or strategically Ooh. placed things, so it's not quite nude, but uh, yeah. Yep. My, my readers tend to write all the sexy scenes in fanfiction.net. <laughs> yep. All right, let me hand you to the guys, and uh, thanks for answering my questions. Yep. Uh, just on the subject of fan art and fan fiction, I have, uh, like, it's one of my favorite, fan art is one of my favorite things, and uh, I've, dif I've discovered that no matter how hard I suggest that people write f uh, fan fiction or, or provide fan art, it seems like it doesn't really alter the, uh, the volume of it at all. So I've really, <laughs> I sort of stopped... Uh, gently requesting the people to draw pictures. Oh, I didn't gently request. I held contest for it. <laughs> In that case, I might have to try again because <laughs> this is the this is the often re referred to this is my cabinet of awesomeness and it contains yeah. stuff that I've commissioned, but I have some some fan art in there as well. Uh so I wouldn't mind uh, uh running a contest to get to yeah. get more of that uh filled up. So, there's a marketing tip I'm probably going to follow. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I'm a big fan of contests, and I think YA audiences really enjoy them as well. I should ask, when you run a contest, uh, what, what do you choose? What's your, uh, your what do you generally give as a as a uh, prize? Uh, it depends. I tend to approach marketing as the heaviest time I need to market is the three months before a book comes out and the month that one month after. So I will I will gradually build up, and so the first. The third month before the book comes out, it'll just be an arc of the book, an early copy of the book. And then the second month, it'll be an early copy plus maybe some extra little things Swag. that 
Yes, yeah, swag, stuff that, that fits in with the book. Um, but then always when I have release week, I always do a really big contest, and I usually will save up for a year or more for those prizes. Um, last year I did 50 signed books. So yeah. every book event that I went to, I picked up a signed book from an author and just added it to a pile. And one person got an entire library of signed books. That's excellent. Yeah. See, and I, what I like about that, as opposed to a lot of the other contests where you get something that's not even really related to, like, people will give out Amazon gift cards or, or yeah. Kindles. And, I mean, these are book-related, but they're also the sort of thing where a reader wouldn't necessarily, like, some someone might win your Amazon gift card and then spend it on, I don't know, fancy jerky. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you need the fancy jerky. You can't just oh, have the stand, standard stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I always, I'm a fan. I, well, I did a contest once where I had this, really elaborate charm bracelet that went with a book and like the, the winner got a book and the charm bracelet. Uh, then several months later I met that the winner in person. She came to one of my signings and she gave me back the bracelet that was really rather expensive. Wow. She was like, oh, I didn't really care about the bracelet. I just wanted the book. And ever since I heard that I was like, it does not matter how expensive the prize is. Yeah. Readers want books. So I've always tried to focus on that sort of thing. Definitely a good policy. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, it's practically con it's practically mandatory uh, for mm -hmm. one book's marketing materials to discuss the other successful books that preceded it. And now that you're pretty much you say fifty fifty hybrid, uh, yeah, you're a perfect hybrid is what I would call it. You're exactly fifty <laughs> fifty. Uh, yeah. Do the traditional publishers uh, ever reference your self published books in their marketing material, or do they ignore them? Um, well, the to be fair, three of the self-published are nonfiction that don't really fit in with the fiction novels. Um, but in general, they don't they don't really pay attention to it. I have had some traditional publishers include the Body Electric when I've given blurbs to other authors, so that has gotten on some marketing materials in that way. But in general, not really. It's it's the bastard child. Yeah, it seems to be the the, the policy. I mean. It's like, yeah, they're not in the business of helping you sell your books, just the books that they are selling for you. Well, to be fair, all of my traditional published books come from Penguin. If I jump ship to, say, Harper, Harper probably wouldn't promote my Penguin books. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's funny because it's like, it, it, it makes excellent business sense to avoid uh, publicizing another publisher's books, yeah. but when it comes to self-published books, the other publisher is also their author, which is a weird uh, dichotomy. It is. It, it definitely is. Although sometimes, if it goes really, really well, that can become a book they pick up. Like Kara Cass had self-published The Siren, and after the selection did fantastically well, now Harper is publishing The Siren. That's uh, that's you hear about that a bit, and it's funny too because you'll also hear like when you when you read usually traditional uh, agents uh, giving advice in, in columns, they'll be like, remember, we're never going to pick up a self-published book because once it's already been out there, then it has no interest for us anymore. And then you see people like Hugh Howey or, or uh, uh, Andy Weir, where this was, Andy Weir was almost perfectly backwards in his, pu his uh, publishing career. You know, it's just like, yeah. never say never. That's true. But on the other hand, I'm nowhere near as good a writer as Andy Weir. <laughs> Very few people are. Yeah. Oh, we can only hope. <laughs> it's it's a little bit devastating when the number one piece of advice anyone ever gives is be really excellent at writing wonderful books, and then people will buy them. That's all you have to do. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's so, such a little easy thing. Decide to be awesome. Yes. <laughs> uh, you went over this a little bit before, but it's just just to sort of. Uh, you know, stated simply, what motivates you to pick between self-publishing and traditional publishing when you're when you're uh, developing an idea for for publication? Well, now that I've had some background in both and kind of see how they go, I have found that I've approached some projects with an idea of this would be good for self-publishing or this would be something I only want traditionally published. Um, the thing I'm working on now is a fantasy novel that's probably going to be a standalone, and it's a very dense. There's, it's not. Like, it's not a short, sexy book. It, it's a very dense, thick, almost philosophical book that I really don't think could do anything in a self-published market. So I, I look at that one, I'm like, obviously this one's going to go towards a traditional publishing path. Um, I have some other things that are a lot shorter, a lot more fun, sort of one-offs. I'm like, well, this would, if I stage them correctly, could build up momentum in a self-publishing path. So it just kind of depends on, on the project that I think would fit better for it. 
That makes a lot of sense, and it's it's interesting, really, that it's sort of a marketing decision. It's like there are certain uh, like when you're self-publishing, you want to be able to build momentum, and and uh, and a series is better for self-publishing. So it's it's interesting. Like often, uh, like people will self-publish because the content that they're interested in producing is just not marketable. Which it's still marketing. It's always marketing. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's it's an interesting thing. And um, just one more question here. Mm -hmm. Can you see yourself transitioning a series from one style of publishing to another? It's, it's interesting because you sort of did, because you, your self-published yeah. book is part of the same uh, universe. Yeah, I call it a companion novel. and I mean, n none of the same characters repeat, but it's, it's essentially the same world. Um, and actually, I think for a lot of people, that's going to be a route that they ultimately take because there, there comes a time when the books kind of run out of steam in the traditional market, but if the readers still want more, even if it's a fraction of the readers from the traditional market, that can still be an important fraction in a self-publishing market. So I, I think for a lot of traditionally published authors, that's going to be their gateway drug into self-publishing. Yeah. I think the magic fraction is probably one-fifth. I think you can sell one-fifth as many books self-published and make about as much as you make uh, traditionally published because of the, the royalty split being, being weighed in your favor. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's difficult to say, well, this book is going to attract 20% of the audience, and therefore I will self-publish it instead. If you could figure exactly. out exactly how much audience it would have, you should probably yeah. be in another career than writing. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's numbers and math. I, I got nothing there. Yeah. All right, well, that uh, finishes up my marketing questions, so now I'm going to hand you off to Jeff for just a few more. All righty. Well, you already covered my first question, which was, you know, comparing, like, when you traditionally publish a title, uh, have you actually been kind of keeping an eye on what the, your traditional publisher does, so that way you can market your indie the same way? So you already covered that one. So I'm going to move over to my uh, next question, which was regarding mailing lists. I started wondering, mm -hmm. you know, as a traditional published author, do you have any control over like, your own mailing list? Oh, absolutely. I'm the one who, who is in control of my mailing list. My Actually, my publisher never brought up a mailing list. And when I was doing Across the Universe, I had a newsletter sign-up form, and I would do like, I don't know, two or three newsletters a year maybe. Um, and it wasn't until I was looking into self-publishing the Body Electric that my agent said, well, if you're going to do this, you need to have a newsletter. And I was like, oh, I, I do have a newsletter. And she's like, she didn't say it this way because she's a nice professional lady, but she was kind of like, you need a newsletter that doesn't suck. I was like, well, maybe I do. Um, so it wasn't until I did the Body Electric that I really amped up my newsletter and it's made a huge difference. Um, before that, I think I had maybe 400 or 500 subscribers, and now I have 2,600. And before I was self-published, I was doing you know sporadic one, two times a year, and now I do it every month. And that's, that regimen and focusing on recruiting new people to join my newsletter has definitely made a difference in both branches of my publishing and success. So obviously the, the, the sign-ups that you have for with fans from your traditionally published titles, mm -hmm. it's just the same amount as what you have for your, your self-published. I mean, you don't have like two separate lists. It's just all one big list? All one big list. If, the, if they want me, they can have me in both ways. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> And with That's regards a bad, to bad out of context quote, I'm just gonna go no comprendo. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, God, I just lost the train of thought. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Incentive. All right. So when you're mm -hmm. trying to get people to sign up for your newsletter, I mean, do you offer them any sort of incentive that says, "Hey, you know, get a free this for signing up"? Or, you know, I mean, how do you encourage more people to subscribe to your newsletter? Well, when I started, I mean, at, when I really started focusing on it, because before it was very passively just a link on my website, when I started really focusing on it, I, I did a few contests where signing up for the newsletter counted as an extra entry, um, and then I would do, um, like, if you're, in, if you're a member of my newsletter subscription list, you get to see the cover first, and, and I would tweet and do social media in that way to kind of encourage people to do it. Um, now, I do that less, because I've found that all I really need to do is add a little note on the bottom that says, um, if, the, if I'm running a giveaway or a contest, and you have to give your email address to join, I just have a little checkbox that says, can I sign you up for my email? And usually half of the people say, yeah, sure, sign me up for your email list. Um, and then whenever I do a newsletter, I always tweet beforehand, and I say, if you're a member of my newsletter, you're going to get my newsletter at midnight tonight. Here's the sign-up link. 
and I always get five or ten more people who are like, oh yeah, this sounds interesting, and they'll sign up for it. So it's become a, almost a part of the routine that I will casually bring up and mention the newsletter and include that sign up link, and it, it slowly builds more and more in, in a very positive way. Very cool. All right, let's see here. Let me go down to my next uh, question here. Okay, what are some marketing strategies or tactics that you feel authors aren't taking enough advantage of? Maybe because they don't know it exists. I mean, what do you? What would you say? I would say that traditionally published authors are definitely not taking advantage of newsletters. That is something that the self-publishing authors honed in on and realized was an important thing and they're doing that and traditionally published authors really aren't and that is not to their credit. Um, so that's what that for the traditionally published authors it's not doing a newsletter. For self-published authors I for some of them it's not taking advantage of social media or limiting it to only Facebook. I don't know why Facebook is so popular. <laughs> I the, a lot of self-published authors will only have so Facebook as their social media, whereas they could, they could <laughs> sorry, not to slam you, but, but Twitter, <laughs> there's a great opportunity to use on Twitter. If you bring in Instagram, if you bring in that sort of thing, you could really spread that out. Um, and, and each of them are different, so don't just feed them into one another, but take the time. It, an hour out of your day can easily, easily cover all your bases on social media. And linking to that, that what I'm just saying is also use graphics. Um, there's a lot of very, very easy programs such as Canva.com that can make graphics in a flash for you. And if you include graphics with your social media aspect, you're going to do very, very well. Do you spend an hour a day on uh, social media? Yeah, probably. That's, that's probably about average for me, especially since having a baby. I, I might... It, maybe two hours on a good day if I'm not working on a deadline, but yeah, maybe an hour a day spread out. Okay. Uh, my final question is uh, one I always like asking our, our, our guests here. If you were able to give a younger version of yourself some advice, what would it be? Um, wow. I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to mess with the space-time continuum because <laughs> things turned out pretty well. Right. I'm not going to screw okay. that up. My author aside, you know, what, what would you, <laughs> if you weren't worrying about consequences, what would you, what would you advise? I, I would advise um, to not lose sight of your goals and to not give up what you want out of your career because everybody does have different things that they want out of their career. And having a clear goal and clearly knowing what I wanted has made the biggest difference in my career in terms of a career than anything else. Okay, well, that's a good answer. I, I'm not. I've always asked myself if I was asked that question, how would I answer? And I really don't have an answer yet, so I have to take some <laughs> time to think about it. But alrighty, so those are my questions. Let me hand you over to Lindsay and see if we can probably wrap this up, maybe a little bit early. I can always ask more questions. We, we <laughs> booked her for a whole hour here, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, but Beth, I love that idea of kind of getting more newsletter signups by just tweeting that like, hey, you know, there's going to be an excerpt or, or whatever you're going to give to your newsletter people, you know, kind of letting them know ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, the, a shocking number of people just don't even think to sign up for it and they, they're just not aware of it. So just casually mentioning it once or twice a month, it makes a difference. Uh I like the option where I do it too, where I'll tell you know people that hey, you want to have a sneak peek at the cover? I'm mm -hmm. going to show it to all the subscribers at a newsletter going to happen sometime tonight or tomorrow. So I usually get a bunch of people signing up for that too. So it works well. You get even more if you use Twitter. <laughs> she already knows you, Jeff. She knows you're not on Twitter. What a loser! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll think about it. I don't think any of us are on Instagram though, so I was I just wanted to ask before we wrap up, um, do you have any is that one good for YA? I've kinda heard that there's a lot of teen audience on there. Yeah, I think Instagram and Tumblr is where I tend to reach my audience that are, are actual teenagers. And Facebook and Twitter is kind of fifty fifty on teens and adults. More and more adults on Facebook. Is that kind of where you're posting the graphics? Those are you actually have to do pictures on Tumblr, don't you? 
Um, on, Insta- on Instagram, it's, Instagram, it's all photographs. Yeah, okay. Instagram is entirely photographs. But I use graphics across the board for all three. And Canva makes it super simple. Canva.com is a really, really easy program to use. Um, and they have automatic templates for all the social media. Canva.com, I'm going to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of base your graphics on your book covers, or do you have other artwork and stuff that you use also? Um, I would usually use just my book covers or, or sort of a plain background or design, but I make it easy on myself. I don't. I do not spend much time doing this. I usually whip out a graphic for all my social media in like 30 minutes while watching television. Yeah, I've kind of been lazy with that. I always I've seen people do <clears throat> like quotes from their books, like funny little humorous things, and I thought I always think, well, that would be really good. I should hire somebody to <laughs> go through and find. Don't some hire. And make them. <laughs> I'm actually working on on that sort of a program for a world without you is that release. And what I did was when I was going through my last copy edits, whenever I got to a quote that I thought was kind of decent, I highlighted it. And then now I have um, there's an app on my phone called Word Swag. You just type in the words, and then it makes it look fancy and and shiny. And it's going to take me like you know an episode of Doctor Who, and I'll have thirty or forty quotes that I can space out over the couple of weeks before the book comes out. Word swag, huh? Word swag. All right. I'm going to look that up too. <laughs> All right. For closing, just do you have any? You've given us a lot of great advice. Do you have any parting advice? Uh, like if a new author came up to you today and said, "I'm thinking of self-publishing or traditional mm-hmm. publishing." What do you think you would advise a new author? Which which way to check out? Um, it, I mean, it depends on their goals, and it also depends on the kind of book that they've written. And I would just ask them to take a really to to know the market. And I, when I say to know the market, all you have to do is read. So if you want to be a Y science fiction author, check out my books, <laughs> and also like all the other Y sci fi that's out there because there's tons of great Y sci fi. And as long as you're reading, you're researching, that's why it counts as a tax credit. So know your market in terms of know what you what, what is out there and read and decide on your goals and just go for it. All right. Sounds like a good good advice. <laughs> um, do you have where can people find you online and are there any particular is there any particular book you would like to recommend for people to check out? Um, well, I am online pretty much everywhere. I'm at BethRevis.com, um, and then Beth Revis is my user handle on all social media, um, except for Facebook. On Facebook, I'm author Beth Revis, so you can find me pretty much everywhere, even the social media that I don't use. I, like, went in and snatched my name. Um, for recommended reading of, like, in general books or... Like if someone's <laughs> never if someone's never read any of your titles, which okay. one would you recommend they start out with? Um, I if you want um, a standalone, The Body Electric works completely on its own. You don't have to read any of the other books to understand that one. Um, if you're ready to dive in and get the full Beth Revis experience, then Go for Across the Universe is a good trilogy. Um, and all three books are out, so there's no waiting time. You can just sign up for them all now. All right, sounds good, and I hope the authors out there, which is a lot of the audience, will also check out your writing books. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure there's a lot of great information in there. Thank you. All three of the Paper Heart volumes are out now. It almost killed me, but they're all out. (laughs) (laughs) All a thousand pages that you whipped out in like four weeks. (laughs) (laughs) I really, really thought to myself, oh, well, they're already written. It can't be that hard to get them all published one month apart. Uh, It was. (laughs) All right, I will put the links to your books and your page and uh, the resources you mentioned in the show notes. This is episode 67, guys. Come on over to marketingsff.com and you can find all the information there. Uh, Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight, Beth. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, Beth. (laughs) Nice to meet you. So long. Bye, everyone. (laughs) Bye.